Sure. Um, good day all. Uh, it's an honor for me to be chatting this session. My name is uh, Arvind Setamadhavan and um, my background is largely in the professional services sector where I've advised corporates on uh, digital and opportunity around digital. But then um, having looked at some of the public private partnerships which are being put in place, uh, every corporate has a great responsibility towards the development of smart cities. And um, I read a statistic uh, recently that about 124 billion US dollars were invested in the development of smart cities globally in 2019. Uh, all of that should see a great fruition. Now 2020, because of COVID-19, has been uh, a pivotal year. Um, it, it's possibly a pressure test for smart cities, smart city leaders, policy makers, etc. So I've had an active interest in the development of smart cities. Uh, I'm currently the executive member of the Smart Cities Network here in Singapore. And I'm honored today to be uh, chairing this panel and dialogue titled Envisioning and Building Smart Cities um, with an esteemed uh, group of panelists, um, global and diverse, whom I'm going to just start by introducing uh, before we kick off this session, starting with uh, Jerry Halton. Uh, Jerry is based in New York, so very early morning for him. Uh, Jerry he is currently the chair of the New York Academic of uh, Academy of Sciences, as well as the chairman of the Global Futures Group, which advises cities, states, and countries on best practices in smart city development. Um, we then have Ashok Kinha, uh, chairman and managing director at Atamas Venture Management, uh, Private Limited. Ashok has been instrumental in management of funds and fund managers and real estate developers for over 20 years, an area which is absolutely critical for the development of smart cities. Uh, we then have uh, Dr. Nitin Tripathi from Bangkok. Uh, I forgot to mention, uh, Ashok is dialing in from India, Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Nitin is dialing in from Bangkok. Uh, Nitin Tripathi is professor of the Asian Institute of Technology based in Thailand. Uh, he's editor-in-chief of um, uh, the International Journal of Geoinformatics. Um, we then have um, Alfonso Vegara dialing in from Madrid. Uh, who's the founder and honorary president of Foundation Metropoli. Is that correct uh, uh, pronunciation, Alfonso? Yes, correct. Uh, <laughs> an international institution focused on helping cities build a better, sustainable future. Um, we have a fifth panelist, Prashad Medikondo, who's the founder of Goa Enterprises India. Goa is an IoT and wireless retrofit smart solution provider. Um, Prashad should be joining us any moment now, and we will welcome him. So um, with that, you know, like I said, this is an esteemed group of panelists. The context I've set up is, you know, smart cities. Uh, this is a pivotal year with what is happening with COVID-19. Um, and envisioning and building smart cities, uh, is, it, it is imminent. Um, I have seen examples very quickly of areas like command centers now gaining so much prominence. Every city in ASEAN, now the command centers have become hubs where everybody is visiting and has become a lot of prominence. So with that, um, I'm going to reach out to the panelists uh, to give their thoughts on this topic and the context of the pivot which we need to do. Uh, starting with Jerry, can I call you to share a few of your thoughts on this um, topic? Uh, thank you, Arvind. Uh, well, first, I think uh, cities are here to stay. Uh, cities are strong. Uh, if you look at the statistics, 70% uh, of the world's population lives in cities, yet 80% uh, of the GDP of the world is developed in those cities. So it shows that cities have a very uh, high productivity quality. But I do think that uh, things are changing. Cities will change in some ways, just faster now than in the past as we realized that we're more vulnerable than we thought to these kinds of episodes. Uh, I think you'll see density uh, uh, shift. I think you'll see second-tier cities, uh, suburbs, uh, gain an additional appeal as people try to spread out. People work from home, realize that they don't have to pay for high uh, expensive downtown office uh, retail space and office space. I think mass transit's under some stress. Uh, if you look at New York City, ridership is way, way down. Uh, even in the as we begin to open up, it's at 25% of normal capacity. Uh, this is uh, 
again, a result of density, but also because a lot of these systems are slow and relatively expensive uh, compared to what the technology could deliver. Uh, I think urban real estate's in for a big shock in terms of uh, office capacity because you're realizing now if you can work from home, people are going to start working in the office two days a week, maybe one day a week and work four days at home. That suddenly reduces the need for space in a city like New York. In many cities, their downtown is built to hold a lot of people. Uh, I think that's going to change. Uh, certainly virtual relationships are on the increase. They have their faults, but they have their pluses. Saying here we are, five of us across the globe. No one paid for an airplane ticket. No one uh, had to uh, adjust to time zone changes. I had to get up a little early. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of productivity here, but people to people still has a lot of power. So I would then I'd like to throw the third piece into this, which is not COVID, but it's automation. Automation is going to change the way cities work, the way people work, not only in offices, but in factories. And that's going to put a real shift on the importance of education. So I think, and skilling, I think you'll see cities more and more say, if we're going to succeed, we have to have high quality, efficient, very widespread skilling uh, of uh, young people because all the manual jobs are going to become robots. And robots don't get COVID. Robots work 24 hours a day. They have a lot of pluses. And suddenly, uh, brain power, how smart you are, is going to be the determinant of your value. And cheap labor economies, the way Malaysia grew itself on cheap labor, the way China grew itself on cheap labor, may not be an opportunity for India, which puts a real premium on education and skilling, way beyond the capacity of the current systems. So... When I look at that, I say, uh, put your bet on education, put your bet on new ways of giving people skills, uh, put your bet on new housing that supports working at home, uh, increase connectivity. I think connectivity is going to go up, up, and up so that this would feel much more like we were actually all together in a room. It's pretty good now, but it'll get a lot better. Uh, transportation's under pressure to get safer, uh, some way to to handle density, and government services could get a lot smarter, which would open up a fair amount of uh, capital for other services. So final thought I have is, uh, as, as it was pointed out in the beginning, don't focus too much on COVID. Once a vaccine exists, there are probably two futures. We're not sure which way it goes. But with a COVID vaccine, we could see a great return to many of the ways we like to operate, people to people, traveling, et cetera. But we may not. Maybe this is a sea change where we've learned to live virtually more often. So I, would keep, I wouldn't get rid of all my office space. I wouldn't get rid of all my conference rooms. I wouldn't get rid of all the ways that we get together, movie theaters, et cetera. But I keep my options open to ways to go. I see. Great. Now, that's interesting points you touch upon, you know, spaces, education, etc. Uh, I'll probably call on Alfonso now. You, know, you have a background in architecture and you've been um, shaping urban architecture for a while. What are your thoughts in the context of some of the points that he made and your own on this topic of how spaces are going to evolve, urban spaces? Many, many people, when after the, the pandemic uh, happened, uh, thought that probably this is the end of the city because city is polluted, is congested, is not the place to fight against this pandemic. That we are suffering one now, but probably in the future we will have more events like, like that. But uh, as um, many people in our profession think, the city is not the problem. Right? The city is the solution right? of this uh, kind of uh, situation. One of the key challenges now for uh, achieving a real, a real uh, smart city is not only about using the technology. We need to use uh, urban design eh, and to create a model for the city. One of the key challenges now that everything is accelerating in cities, now the local, local authorities are ready to make big changes to be more, uh, to accelerate administrative uh, bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Now, I think uh, more than ever, we need to have a participatory 
a joint vision of the future of the city for this real transformation. Because the battle uh, of the competition of cities, the, the competition today is not between countries, it's between cities. So the competition is not only about organizing events no? or about attracting tourism or even about attracting investment. The real battle, the real competition is about uh, educated talent, retain the talent and attract the talent. So how physical form of the city can contribute to the challenge of attracting talent is the quality of place. So the design of the city, and not only the city, but the territory that is beginning and gaining, gaining importance uh, is, is something very relevant. So the big uh, challenge of attracting talent is about creating an uh, attractive an attractive city in their territory. And so medium-sized cities will have a much more relevant. And technology will allow people to work from different locations. But mm -hmm. the key is to live where, uh, to work where do you would like to live. So the battle of designing the cities of the future is something that will be key in, in our moment. And the technology will be a commodity eh, that will, will be uh, possible to use in different contexts. But the key will be the, the, to have a vision, to have an attractive uh, um, objective for the future, and then to work together with a new uh, dynamism in this transformation. Okay, thank you, Anfonso. I think um, in the context of designing cities, can I call upon you, Ashok? Um, you're uh, heavily involved in a sector uh, which is which shapes cities, right? Real estate. Um, can you uh, share your thoughts, please? Uh, you're, you're on, uh, Ashok. Sorry, I think you'll have to unmute your. Uh, Sure, sure. Thanks, Arvind. I'll just further the thoughts which uh, Jerry and Alfonso have shared. They are pretty much bang on, on the coin here. So uh, even if COVID wouldn't have happened, the world, because of technology and its, its role in its uh, daily lives, we were moving to captive smart clusters any which ways. And, and I think Alfonso has put in beautifully well that we need to be closer to where we work our lives have to be as close to us. We don't have to travel and we, sh we shouldn't be traveling for our basic requirements, which is uh, capability to go to your earning place. You shouldn't be traveling too far for your education. You shouldn't be traveling too far for healthcare. So basic aspects of life, a smart city or any planned city for that sake, it, it, these things are something which technology is, was already taking over. And we will see this, this trend especially post-COVID times, catching up faster now. So uh, every country, it's not about India only, every country going forward, the connectivity not being an issue at all between people to people owing to tech that we have now. Yeah. So uh, yes, yeah, smart cities are the, the, is, a, is, is a present, is a future, and India has exponential potential. It's, it's an opportunity, especially now, we are at a stage where Germany was was looking to kind of recoup and grow fast post-1945. And we have, what we have today in, in our country is sufficient talent, enough solid manpower, amazing market. We have all kinds of raw materials, resources. And all that we need is beautiful planning, beautiful uh, open policy making that will open out floodgates for professionals, experts who come in India and express themselves in, in, in building up these smart cities. So I'll, I'll just, just leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ashok. I think um, that's a very interesting perspective on you know, how you remodel cities in the context. Um, Nitin, uh, can I call upon you? Because you, you come from an interesting background of uh, academic and as well as being in a city which uh, uh, Bangkok, um, w which has got an interesting confluence of trying to be smart and traffic and everything else. Uh, so what are your thoughts on this topic uh, and some of the points which the panelists brought up? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have been in Bangkok for the last 20 years in Asian Institute of Technology. So I have seen the city, how fast it is growing and how fast the traffic jams despite so many 
facilities are coming up are increasing plus air pollution also sometimes is very high and that is impacting the health so uh, for me the smart city one of the major aspect is the health care smart health care so i will focus on smart health care and uh, this is very pertinent for indian cities like mumbai delhi chennai kolkata etc which are hugely populated and uh, health care facilities are one of the lowest in the world in india like we rank 154th in in the world and per capita is spent on health care is only 250 us dollar which is almost 12000 us dollar per capita in usa which is number 1 so i think uh, there is a lot to be done for health care and uh, this covid has uh, really exposed the health care system of india and uh, now government is putting lot of emphasis they are putting lot of money temporary basis but i think when we are talking of smart cities uh, we cannot ignore health care anymore and uh, i will say that uh, uh, we have to go for virtual hospitals to create the real infrastructure will take time but virtual hospital should come like apollo has a virtual hospital and uh, they provide all the facilities online like consultation appointment uh, doctor consultation and then sometime they send uh, people to take samples uh, for testing and they even send medicines and a patient can contact them frequently so i think apollo is doing but uh, almost all government hospital in the urban areas should do that india is a big population in bangkok we have very good practice by for virtual hospital or e health from bamrungrad hospital mm-hmm. bangkok hospital samiti vej so many hospitals have switched over to virtual and online because people don't want to pay uh spent too much time in the traffic mm-hmm. so i think uh, this e health care virtual health care or smart health care is the thing that we have to focus when we are talking about smart cities and uh, mainly problem is about uh, uh, old people they cannot they are living sometimes a uh, uh, couple is living alone children are far away and they need uh, weekly care sometime daily some kind of a care so i think geriatric uh, uh is smart and very important now and uh, we have to make uh, infrastructure ready for that and uh, we have to train the hospitals and motivate them to provide virtual health care uh, till we come to the level that uh, uh, physical infrastructure is very strong and e pharmacy like medicines already there are a lot of apps which are providing a medicine you can just uh, call on that or order and it is coming but uh, i think many people are not aware especially the senior people are not aware how to do that so some kind of a training do house to house for that purpose should be done and uh, this this will create lot of job opportunities uh, like in covid 19 time we have seen supply chain and logistic were drastically improved in a very short time i mm-hmm. think that is one area for healthcare also we can do and uh, then trauma assistance like uh, accidents occur and uh, some bangkok is very good but in, i think in india uh, because of traffic jams you can imagine a delhi and bombay how to provide trauma health care trauma assistance to the accident victims is very is a crucial issue so how to create some kind of a green corridor for taking them to hospital in real time by intelligent transport system i think uh, these are the things i will like to uh, raise at this forum Okay, good. Right. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Nathan. I think healthcare is obviously very topical at this stage, and um, and you referenced a lot of things about technology. And so, Prashad, can I call upon you? Um, uh, you you come from a background where you know you have a technology-based business. Um, yes. Can you can you share your points, please, on the topic and what you see as evolution of smart cities? Thanks, thanks, Hal. Uh, nice to meet you all here. Firstly, my apologies for the delay. I got stuck somewhere. <laughs> Uh, as I, I should, I uh, mean, I would agree with all the panelists. Everyone has brought uh, different, different points, which is essential to the smart cities. I just put my point for then forward. So, what is a smart city essentially? So, it should be efficient, responsive, and sustainable, right? So, every user, every stakeholder in this smart city, let it be user, let it be citizens, let it be governments, let it be businesses. Every, all three of us. 
uh, look for what these three points right efficient responsive and sustainable so as i speak about sustainable it it means uh, environmental sustainability social sustainability and uh, economical sustainability three sustainabilities we need to achieve in order to create a futuristic smart cities in real time so without if we are if we are taking one brick out of all these three nothing the smart city won't become a true smart what we call and another aspect which i would like to touch upon is kind of uh, safety also this is again goes with the same thing so as nitin uh, has already mentioned road safety because of the cities what Uh, we have and the scale of the cities and the people population per square meter the population density is too high in all the cities not only in india especially in all our cities what is happening across so that uh, road safety is one main important aspect which smart cities should largely concentrate on it doesn't mean that only installing these cc cameras and looking for the culprits and uh, fast drives it should it should mean something like road repairs automatic repairs finding the uh, um, finding the repair there and then and quick response to it efficient uh, um, uh, service provider relationships all these things is needed at the same time social safety also so how we live in what is the communication between different different people happening different societies so the problem with the cities is they create large gap between the poor and the rich so government should also ensure that all the quality parameters what rich is getting should, should be given to the poor as well so that is another aspect and i would insist on environmental safety so most of the people we as a human race we create a large cities and we forego the entire environment aspect of it so one one thing what happened covid so covid has taught many things to the human race so i think this is the time where we need to stick on to the point and say that yeah we live in this earth we have to protect our environment and we need to give it to our uh, further generations also that is one area which most of the cities has largely to concentrate in india especially we need to concentrate on that aspect because bombay delhi bangalore hyderabad these are the cities where this pollution levels is rising high and high every day on day and one more thing why i am insisting on environmental safety especially this air pollution and pollution uh, because i have studied about the uh, largest and good model the developed smart cities let it be dubai let it be singapore let it be barcelona all these cities lack one thing they have developed robust road systems they have developed uh, robust smart metering smart lighting all these things but all of them still struggling to get and cure that uh, environmental aspect of that uh, smart city so i would insist we should concentrate more on environment at the same time safety side of it i see okay now that's good thank you so you know very insightful recommendations right you, you spoke about designing spaces healthcare um education uh, and sustainability and environment and um, i'm going to ask a question now on uh, zooming in on india the context you know smart cities are not something new the government uh, i think in 2015 they unleashed a 100 city smart program uh, 200 city actually and currently there is talk about uh, pushing it to another 4000 cities now you know the context of smart cities you know i think some countries have had the opportunity to go for greenfield projects uh, indian cities and urban infrastructure is largely focused on the bigger city so you need to go for brownfield projects so the question i have for each of you is around um what has been accomplished what do you think has been accomplished in the smart city charter which has been going on for some time uh, as the job done in any form uh, and are we ready to move on to 4000 cities um so ashok can i uh, start with you again so uh, you're close to the subject uh, in some ways yeah so what has happened in from 2015 to now is uh, indian smart city scheme is more of a retrofit or a urban renewal scheme as of now there hasn't we haven't seen any greenfield projects like the way we we came out with cities like chandigarh only exception today being uh, the new state capital of andhra pradesh which is also held up for certain reasons but uh, the next smart city that that we would have seen coming on indian soil is amravati which is new capital city of andhra pradesh so anyone who's developing 
greenfield project in these times where wherein there is openness in sharing technology for different reasons and for sure pecuniary uh, purposes mm -hmm. uh, executing smart city from green greenfield is is easy and is pretty much doable in terms of bringing the right uh, teams manpower tech and and so forth but then uh, uh, do we can we do 4000 greenfield cities uh, at at this scale within certain uh, limits to resources that we have i i have my doubt there can we do a mix of retrofit and somewhere between greenfield and brownfield i, I think that's something which we as entrepreneurs should push our government to open uh, the system out to and uh, yeah so if if we have to look at uh, say structures which are smart cities on their own captive to themselves this will not help indian population 1.3 billion and growing mm -hmm. we have to come up with some sort of uh, hub and spoke kind of uh, uh, smart city development model wherein resources of smart cities are always organized and developed in a manner that the the villages and suburb areas in surroundings up to 30 40 kilometers in circumference they do not come and gravitate towards the city infrastructure and rather city infrastructure grows simultaneously as new cities are being refitted with uh, smart city concept okay. the, the infrastructure should travel out to these suburbs so that there is equitable distribution of development mm -hmm. as well as the wealth that comes with smart cities or optimization of resources that happens with smart cities okay thank you thank you ashok alfonso what are your thoughts you know i know you've done projects across various countries in this whole arena uh, what, what learnings can you share for india yes uh, i think the initial uh, project of 100 uh, smart cities was more focused about selecting places to apply smart technology eh, technology but i think uh, the scale of the population, the scale of the territory, and it's, we need now to go from city to territory, eh? a new scale of thinking. Uh, usually the mega cities, uh, the big cities, are losing competitive advantage. They have the magnetism of the concentration of capital, talent, people, but they have a lot of problems in terms of pollution, mobility. So medium-sized cities are rising. We have some statistics showing the growing role of medium-sized cities in the territory of the future. Mm -hmm. The problem of the medium-sized cities to operate globally, they do not have the critical mass in terms of connectivity, airport with the frequency, or in terms of the cultural options or university opportunities. So the only way that medium-sized cities can be relevant in a global context is by collaborating one city with the other cities. We call the urban system, and particularly we call the diamond, the territorial diamond. So diamond is about polycentric structure of cities. So in the, in the past, cities was the engine of the economy. In the future, the diamonds, the territorial diamonds, and the super cities will be the new, the new engines. So in my opinion now, in relation with India, there's a huge challenge around super cities and territorial diamond to give coherence and to connect the urban world and the rural world together. And the technology can develop a very uh, important role to uh, activate this new balance between uh, uh, rural areas, medium-sized cities, and uh, super cities. So my suggestion is focusing on super cities and territorial diamonds as a next step of the application of smart city program in India. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, yeah, can, I so, uh, can I call on you? Yeah, well, I wanted to just, excuse me, let me get rid of. Yeah, I was just going to call on you. For um, I wanted to bring up, um, I, sure. I like your idea and I agree with you because I was going to add, just a second, <laughs> my phone is insisting <laughs> on staying on. Okay. Uh, the Am I still on? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 So uh, 
Two things. One is I was going to add to Prashad's uh, points about the three pillars. I would add a fourth, which I think Alfonso raised, which I would call either fun, F-U-N, or let's call it culture and excitement. And without that, uh, I think people don't like to live in cities, and Nitin and Ashok have both raised these issues. So, But I was going to raise the issue that one of the problems, I like your idea, Alfonso, the issue is uh, governance. We currently have cities too limited in their reach out to those suburban areas. And so we have this incursion of these under, uh, sort of uncontrolled peri-suburb, peri-urban areas that it really we need to solve this governance problem. It may be a role for the state, uh, but the state's got to think more like an urban developer than a state government. Uh, and I think in India, there's a great opportunity because there's a lot of desire to live not in the central city, but in this ring around the city. And if those were vibrant, connected, sighting places to live, prices would be lower. If there's good transportation, this could be great, as you call them, uh, uh, territorial diamonds. But there's a governance issue that's got to be dealt with uh, for yeah. sure. There's other issues too, capital, et cetera, but governance prices come real early in this discussion. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting point you raised, uh, Jerry, on governance. And um, a question I'm going to throw now is uh, the concept of ecosystems for uh, uh, smart cities. Right. So there is obviously the government uh, to do a lot of things. What are your views? You know, probably I'll start with you, Nathan, in terms of if you look at governments, private sector, as well as academia, the technology being an important driver of smart cities. Do you see there is sufficient collaborations of what you could call public-private partnerships happening, uh, which is enabling the development of smart cities? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I came to I mean, sir, in one of the presentation, I saw some example from Naya Raipur, Chhattisgarh, and uh, they have done a lot. But what happened? All the technologies have been imported, and uh, it has been put across. People were not trained, so they are not able to benefit much from the smart city. Still, they're wondering where is the smart city in many of the places like Tirupati and Coimbatore and all. So uh, people's training and awareness is a major issue. I think academia must be engaged and uh, to impart the training. And also indigenous technologies should be developed like uh, India cannot follow the pattern of some developed countries where house numbers and everything is in order. Here it is a haphazard growth of the cities and house numbers and everything. So moving and delivering the things and everything is uh, very uh, in a very different way. Like in Coimbatore, some uh, indigenous uh, way of uh, address matching was done for GIS map. I teach uh, geographic information system. So I came across that, how in the smart city address matching was done for household because houses are not uh, like in Thailand, left side is like odd number of houses, right side is even number. So this kind of standardization is still not there in the old cities. So I think, uh, uh, I think uh, local solutions are important. Plus mm -hmm. uh, people has to make it smart to use the smart technologies. A lot of new technologies are coming every day. New apps are coming. Like say even Arogya Setu, uh, which has come for health. Uh, many people do not know they are afraid. Senior people are afraid to touch that. So I think uh, some kind of awareness and academia must be engaged, uh, not only for training, but also developing some indigenous technology for smart cities. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just on that point, Prashant, you know, you, you come from a technology provider perspective. Are you seeing barriers? Are you seeing challenges to, you know, the way you're rolling out your technology? Are you Are getting enough support from government? Yes. Uh, support is there from the government. Yes, of course, technology challenges is always there. So because we uh, try to provide solutions uh, for multiple cities here in India. So, so uh, consider two cities. One is Bangalore and another one is Kohima in Nagaland. So these two cities, the geographical stats is different and their demographics is different. One is a hill station, one is a, uh, a bare land and both of them. So the city scale is also different. 
So whereas when we went to Sikkim in particular, Sikkim is another hill station where we went. The mobile signal is very very low, so you couldn't able to get a proper signal there. When we tested out with our equipment to try to provide a robust network for the sensors, what we are going to install there for lighting, it take us almost a lot of time. And of course, the government was supportive there in terms of providing us what are the inputs needed, permissions needed, on time response was there from the government side. That is always there. I find out the technology. Technology support is always there from the government side. The innovation support is, however, lacking from the government side. So every government, in terms of smart cities, when we approach them with an innovative solution, they are afraid to implement it because unless until it is implemented somewhere. So suppose I am approaching a government with a proven uh, water meter or some other energy meter reading uh, devices. I said this is this has been implemented across the world or across the Europe for around 10 million devices. So they are ready. They will. Readily jump on it and they will take it. Oh yes, this is good. This is working. We don't want to take any risk with our uh, city. So I do agree for that because yeah, cities is uh, for large uh, group of people, so they cannot do the uh, uh, experiments with that. But at least they can encourage the innovation solutions so that what happens is, see, essentially a city, a smart city, is to solve mass problems, right? Mass problems and provide a ease ease of uh, their living in the city, so that. My belief that only comes from the innovation rather than uh, bringing solutions from outside and fixing it here. So I would uh, suggest governments to more concentrate on that. We never know what kind of innovation comes from the uh, 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 from the bottom of the uh, pyramid, right? And one more thing, I have to agree with Dr. Nitin that he, see each city is different and each city has a different uh, stats and all, and it is very tough. We cannot compare India with some other developed company. In terms of, if, if, if being very frank, we cannot compare one city in India with another city. So both the cities has different requirements and different uh, needs and problems altogether. One city parking is a problem. Another city, there is a lot of land where parking is not at all a problem. One city water is a problem. One city electricity is a problem. All these things. And government should proactively look and identify the problems and solve it and move on to the next problem. So that way I should ask governments to concentrate more on it and support innovative solutions in their domains than finding solutions from outside. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I realize we have six more minutes left. Time flies when you have a good conversation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of you um, to provide one final thought. Um, on uh, it is difficult. Smart cities is a big collection. It is healthcare, it's mobility, it is spaces. Um, but if there was one thing which you think um, should be high on priority, what would that be? So, starting with you, Alfonso. Okay. Now, in my opinion, the big change eh, that will happen in the next decades is going from city to the territory going from smart cities to smart region eh? yeah. in the context of police centrism, police centrism, eh? having mainly uh, territorial diamonds and super cities oh. and connecting rural areas with, uh, with cities in, in, a new, in a new context. So this is, in my opinion, the big change in the future. And technology can help a lot in this kind of connection. Eh? Okay, quite it. Ashok? Yeah, sure. So in, in my view, India has different kind of uh, climatic zones, ecosystems. Hello, can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Yes. Wait. Okay. So uh, the easiest for government to do is to shift from approval mechanism for each state government. Uh, there are thirty odd states. Each state government has to quickly shift from approval mechanism to acknowledgement mechanism. There's thirty four percent urbanized population and one hundred thirty one point three billion people living in India. At 50%, we'll be having a mass of people living in cities, which is an opportunity. If there is zoning, only zoning done by state governments of respective state land parcels within contained in each, each of those 30 odd states yeah. and allow only acknowledgement model for private players to come in and develop those territories, as, as uh, Mr. Vagera has put in, this is huge opportunity for entrepreneurs, developers, infrastructure, tech guys, and public will take care of it then from their own because ownership of development of smart cities all of a sudden is shifting onto public as, as they are becoming stakeholders. Okay. Stop. So this is a short, short solution which can really uh, catalyze the development in India. 
Great, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Uh, Nathan, yourself, I realize our clock is running down three more minutes. I don't know if uh, the webcast will just get cut off, but um, one minute each, please. Nathan is in mute. Uh, a smart city must focus on smart healthcare, where huge opportunities for public and private partnership exist. Government and all, uh, cannot do alone this smart healthcare. And I think uh, it public uh, uh, means a government hospital should engage the uh, like uh, entrepreneurs, uh, IT people, and everybody, and try to provide smart healthcare to the people, especially for uh, old people and pregnant women. Uh, this is very important. And uh, second is, I think, uh, mobility for trauma assistance, ITS should be integrated into the smart city. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Jerry? Jerry, you are in mute. Or uh, Prashad, do you want to just... Yeah, 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 I'll add it on. I think we've got exactly two minutes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I, I will agree with uh, Dr. Ashok and Alfonso with two aspects. As Dr. Ashok shared, divide that smart city into smaller zones and give authority to the local body so that decision will be fast, so that you can scale the smart city program to the smaller cities. That is one thing. And second thing is, as uh, Alfonso saying, that we have to concentrate on building smart villages and smart communities so that you connect smart cities and smart villages to the uh, ultra smart cities and bigger cities so that the entire uh, data flow flows from top to bottom so that the decisions of the smart cities the problems in the mass scale can be solved easily one point of suggestion from my side is divide the smart cities into smaller zones and give the authority to the local body so that the decision will uh, decision uh, taking capabilities will run fast so that the scale of the smart cities will increase from 100 to 400. You can easily scale within five to ten years. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry. Are you back online? I think. cannot hear Jerry, but I'm just going to use this opportunity to thank all of you for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. Some great insights on you know how we look at smart cities. Uh, I think I particularly like the point that it, this shouldn't be about COVID-19. This is something which has been planned on. Uh, if anything, uh, there should be a bit of an acceleration. This is a time where we can pivot. We can relook at how we envision smart cities. Um, so with that, uh, I thank you all for your time, your valuable insights. Uh, have a good day wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind. Thank, thank you very much. Pleasure Please, talking to you. Uh, questions from the audience, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I think uh, there was one question for Jerry, which he answered. So we've been a very uh, great group uh, in terms of how we have answered. We probably structured the questions and the discussions to answer all questions. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So Thank you. be safe and well. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.